the federal government is cutting back on the number of low-wage temporary foreign workers in Canada. Employers will no longer be allowed to hire more than 10 percent of their total workforce through the temporary foreign worker program. The government says the program has been used to get around hiring Canadian workers in some instances, but not everyone is impressed with the changes. These changes are going to hurt. They're going to hurt a lot of small businesses, particularly in, in the hospitality sector, uh, arts and entertainment, travel and tourism businesses, and especially in rural and remote communities. Mr. Trudeau is using a temporary foreign worker as a scapegoat. And now we are disposable. They use, use us and now they throw us away. Mark Miller is the Minister of Immigration. Minister, welcome to the program. Thank you, Catherine. I'd like to start by having you respond to what we just heard from Raul Gattaca talking about uh, migrant workers as, as scapegoats, being treated as disposable. What would you say to him? Well, I think as a country we have to reflect on that. Uh, it is no secret to anyone that has been paying attention to the news and the special rapporteur uh, from the UN that came out and used some very inflammatory words to describe a situation in Canada which shouldn't exist, at least the, the, some of the exceptions that he saw to the program, but he saw systemic trends in the temporary foreign worker space and the agricultural space that really shouldn't exist in a country like Canada, where anyone working here, regardless of their origin or status, needs to be treated with dignity uh, and, and in respect for their rights. Uh, as a country, we have grown that sector of the economy substantially. Uh, I, you know, I would note that that report in particular uh, saw some very uh, limited abuses, but still ones that shouldn't exist in Canada. And so uh, we've also had a Senate report that has said substantially the same uh, conclusions, but a little sober in their characterization of things. So a as a country, as a government, we need to attack those problems at their source. Um, there's a number of measures that we have taken, uh, in my department in particular, to make sure that temporary foreign workers that are abused can have an open work permit to go wherever they wish. That doesn't attack the core of the problem of employers that are uh, behaving in a way that they shouldn't in a country like Canada. Uh, with the announcement yesterday in reducing uh, in the non-agricultural fields the reliance on temporary foreign workers, it's about making sure that the economy is properly aligned in, uh, in, a, in a reality where the economy has contracted, uh, at least the labour market has. So those adjustments are important. but. Again, we do rely as a country. We've relied quite heavily on foreign labor for areas in the agricultural space and the transformation space, but also you know, places like Tim Hortons where it really shouldn't be happening. And in some cases, it's been depressing wages, and that's something that we as a responsible government need to attack. And I think that's what you heard from us yesterday from the Prime Minister, from my colleague Randy Boissonneau, who's responsible for this. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. Well, in fact, some of these groups are saying that you're making the problem worse with some of these changes, that by only allowing temporary foreign workers to stay for one year, you're putting more of a financial burden on them, that if they want to come back, there's additional travel costs. What do you say when they say uh, not only are you treating them as disposable, but that some of these changes are going to make it even harder for these people? Well, there's a lot of folds to answering that question, Catherine. It is a complex one. Uh, there is international mobility in a temporary foreign workspace. It isn't the case that everyone wants to stay. It isn't the case that everyone has the opportunity to stay. A lot of people are funding their, their, uh, their families at home and do go home after, after a season of working in fields or um, in industries that are seasonal in nature. And there are other ones that uh, we have relied too heavily on as, as a country, and we have that workers here that can fill that space. Uh, so there is movement internationally, but it has to be done in dignity and respect of the people that are moving. Uh, and that uh, needs to get better in Canada. We need to increase enforcement, make sure that people are living up to the high standards that we expect people to be treated by in Canada. Uh, and in large part, we do do that. I think the reports that we've seen show that. But there are tendencies that create an unequal relationship between employee and employer that uh, are the roots for some of the systemic issues that we're seeing. So and we need to continue to, to make sure that, we're, that we're, we're getting that right. Well, well, let's talk about that question of the treatment of workers and employers in particular. The NDP has raised um, this information it received through an order paper question, which says, in essence, that of the um, federal inspections that are happening, more than 80 percent of these workplaces are being inspected remotely. Does that seem appropriate to you in a field where there are concerns about abusive behavior? Well, first, it doesn't surprise me. I would say, first and foremost, uh, most of these employers are behaving in a way that is ethical 
and according to law. There are exceptions, and to the extent that there hasn't been sufficient enforcement, we need to crack down. That includes also provinces that do have a responsibility here, um, but we also have to get to the core of this, which is abuse by employers uh, of employees that are in a vulnerable position because of their status in this country. Uh, so whether that's making abused employees, the, giving them the ability to be able to work in another space, uh, looking at sectoral work permits, but that all comes with a cost. Uh, we're in an era of food inflation, uh, and so it's not a question of making uh, these broad changes without soberly analyzing the impact of what those decisions could have on uh, things that uh, Canadians are paying a lot more for these days. So there's some, uh, there's some trade offs to every decision we make, and I think it has to be done in a measured way and in a surgical way. Business groups are also uh, raising concerns about some of the changes you're making. The Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses said, for instance, that um, for places like, you know, tourist, uh, the tourist sector in Banff, for instance, the changes you made it are going to make it a lot harder for some of the businesses that operate there. What would you say to those businesses? I, I obviously don't want to be callous about it. We are sensitive to the tourist industry. Uh, and I don't want to be flip when I say this, but that labor does exist in Canada. In some cases, some employers will have to pay their employees a little more money. Some will have to innovate. Uh, but it doesn't come without us being able to have sort of a healthy back and forth with industry, and those discussions will continue so that we can adjust on the, on the fly. We have seen calls on the other end of the spectrum to completely abolish the low stream, the, the, the low wage stream, because precisely does what that does, which is to drive down uh, wages and drive down innovation. But that's nice on a chalkboard. In reality, it means something completely different from people who may get fired. Uh, and trying to find that labor, in, that domestic labor in Canada isn't as obvious as just uh, going out and th throwing up a sign and trying to get uh, a local Canadian person to do it, because often it is in the job sector that Canadians won't do, but to the extent it is, and that space is there, uh, we should be looking domestically for that labor, particularly in an era of affordability and the, the driving up of, uh, of affordability challenges we see when we have high volumes of people coming into the country. It's not just the low wage stream, you're also talking about potential changes to the high wage stream. Are there sectors in particular that you are concerned by? Well, concerned by, first and foremost, the volume and the growth that we've seen that is unsustainable. I think we have seen, when we look at the population data, uh, significant growth in the last three years. We have to look at where the market is contracting uh, and where it makes most sense uh, to, uh, to make those adjustments. Any responsible government has to adjust on the fly. And in an era of high volume of people coming to the country, whether it's permanent levels or, in this case, temporary levels, it's responsible for us to look at all those programs. You, you talk about um, having to adjust on the fly, but I mean, you're scaling back the number of temporary foreign workers because the levels got too high. You scaled back the number of international students because the levels got too high. Did your government, to some extent, lose control of the number of people entering this country temporarily? Well, look, I'd say the adjustments that were made, particularly after COVID, when we had incredible needs for people uh, and, and just the need to, to, to fill spaces in the job market uh, prevented a recession in this country, probably two recessions, Catherine. So uh, when, we, when, we, when we employ hindsight, we have to make sure we look at the factors we were dealing with at the time. Those factors no longer exist. Uh, and in the international student space that I'm keenly aware of and have made some substantial and substantive changes, uh, there's more work to be done. But what we saw is an area that serious, got seriously overheated. A number of post-secondary institutions taking uh, short-term gain without looking at the long-term pain for the country. And if there's any, uh, if there's any, there's criticism to go around at all levels of government. We're probably the only level of government not making a cent off in international students. Uh, but again, this is a program that aims excellence and it, one that I have the responsibility, along with my colleagues in other provinces, to reform. Uh, we have to take a look at who's coming into the country, at what volume, and for what purpose, and what are the long-term effects. So that's work that is largely. Uh, complete, but we still have some adjustments to make in that space because when we talk about the temp sort of the pie chart that comprises the people that are temporary, temporarily here, uh, a good chunk of that is, uh, is students, international students, and the postgraduate work permits that come with them. I appreciate um, that you're making the argument, uh, prevented a recession or two, but did you overcorrect? I mean, when you look at the circumstances now and you're having to pull back in all these different areas, were there not missteps? Uh, 
you know, look, I'm not, it's not the argument. The International Monetary Fund, the Bank of Canada has said as much, and it is one of these measures have been uh, almost solely responsible for making the labor force younger, which is incredibly important. Immigration writ large, writ large has been incredibly important to do something that a lot of G7 countries have a real challenge doing and some are failing at and we've been pretty successful at. That's come with a conundrum in and around affordability, particularly around housing. And when we see those things congeal, when we see a, an economy that is contracting in areas where we no longer need that help, well then we have to take another look at it, uh, take a step back and look at a bunch of options uh, to contract or at least change the policies that have enabled people to come in in those numbers and that's what we're currently uh, looking at as a cabinet. Uh, there's also talk about changing the permanent resident targets. How significant are the changes that you're prepared to make? I, I appreciate it's still an ongoing discussion, but it, you know, is this? Could we even see levels drop, perhaps? Well, it, one, it, it, all options are on the table, Catherine, including uh, a reduction. And I would say, you know, sometimes ministers do go to cabinet with a number of options, with a particular one that's sort of pre-baked. I'm trying to take a look at what Canadians have told me throughout the summers, what economists have told me, what different actors in society have told me, what my own members of caucus and cabinet have told me, and give three real credible options about what the pathway forward looks for levels. You'll have to wait for the levels announcement to get uh, the final conclusion on that. But again, it does remain talk for the time being because we do have to uh, have that discussion in cabinet with caucus and with Canadians, and uh, that pathway isn't completely set yet. But anything does have to be substantial and substantive. Otherwise, it's just an optical operation uh, that does nothing to solve the challenge that we're facing for. And again, this is the one chance that we have uh, as a government to set that level for the next year and the next three years before there's an election. So uh, there will be a, there'll be an aspect of this that uh, will be fixed in stone once we, uh, once we set those levels for the next year. Minister Miller, thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me on, Catherine. Today's economy is very different from it was two years ago. Inflation has started to come down, employment is higher, and we no longer need as many temporary foreign workers. We need Canadian businesses to invest in training and technology and not increasing their reliance on low-cost foreign labour. Some have applauded the move, saying it will help with employment rates among Canadian residents, but others say the change doesn't go far enough. Christopher Warswick is the chair of the Department of Economics at Carleton University. Welcome to the program. I'd like to start, you have made a call for the government to abolish the temporary foreign worker program. Can you lay out for me what the case is for making that move? Sure, Catherine. Um, I mean, the concern with the temporary foreign worker program is that as the minister said earlier in your show, that firms will become reliant on it. And in fact, in a situation where wages are rising, firms could advertise at the going wage rate. And if the search is unsuccessful, then uh, just bring apply to bring in temporary foreign workers um, from overseas. And so a lot of economists in Canada are concerned about the impact this type of program has on wage growth. I've done research with co-authors that suggests that firms may actually anticipate the, the use of the temporary foreign worker program. They could advertise at a slightly lower wage, maybe even put less effort into their search so that the search fails and they can bring in highly uh, productive uh, temporary foreign workers who might be more mature, might care a lot more about the job because they're leaving a low wage um, economy. and. They, their ultimate goal may be to become permanent, to become actual immigrants so they can sponsor family members. And this creates this power imbalance that, you know, the UN report um, alluded to and others have noted where if the temporary foreign workers really care a lot about their jobs, employ some unscrupulous employers could take advantage of that. So I just want to be crystal clear. What you're saying there is that the essentially the existence of the program itself actually helps push down wages and sort of creates uh, suboptimal conditions in specific cases. Some employers are, whether they're thinking it through or not, um, having a, a negative response to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think at the very least it slows wage growth, mm -hmm. but it could lower wages. And I think there's reasons to think that that's happened from looking at the history. Now, you were listening to the interview with the minister. You heard him say, Great on a chalkboard, this idea of abolishing uh, the, the program or certainly the low-wage dream. But in reality, it would mean people losing their jobs and some of these businesses simply cannot find Canadians. What do you say to that argument? 
It's, well, some people could lose their jobs if companies are, are failing, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the most likely thing that would happen if we eliminated the temporary foreign worker program either immediately or very quickly, you would see firms, some firms who are like just scraping by right now, just marginally profitable, going bankrupt. But lots of companies go bankrupt in Canada every year, and there's new companies that crop up. I don't think that's an argument for bringing in, as the minister said, large numbers of of low wage workers. You know, prior to 2000, we really had no temporary foreign worker program in Canada except in agriculture. So this is a new thing in the last 25 years. And it just seems like it starts small and it becomes large under the Harper government. The same things happen under the Trudeau government. And the economics really don't support this type of program. Immigration, in, in contrast, economic immigration, I strongly support. Highly skilled immigrants coming permanently and they're not tied to an employer. They can work for any employer in Canada they want. There are large benefits to that. So what do you think, what do you say to the argument that some have made, and I will say including the uh, Canadian Federation of Independent Business, that what we actually need to do is uh, not necessarily reduce, get rid of the program, but just make a clearer pathway towards uh, creating permanent status for people whose labor we're, we're so dependent on? I would say that I'm not sure we are as dependent on the labor as, as people make out. I mean, the the I would argue the main feature of a job is the wage. And so if firms fail to fill any job, whether it's low skill or high skill, they can turn around and advertise at a higher wage, as long as the, the firm's profits or profitability can support that. My sense is even with the low skilled uh, stream that the, the government's focused on right now, if the wage went up 5%, that might be enough to bring uh, Canadians and landed immigrants to take on these jobs. And I think that's part of the process of wage growth, raising living standards. I think it would also be good for reducing income inequality in Canada, because instead of bringing in low-wage workers from low-income countries, we'd be allowing a firm, you know, telling firms, as the Prime Minister said, either hire Canadians or immigrants to do these, this work or invest in training of existing Canadians. That seems like a better policy direction. If we can zoom out more broadly to the immigration portfolio as a whole, I mean, enthusiasm for immigration is a hallmark, I would argue, of Justin Trudeau's government. And yet we're at this interesting moment where, as the minister acknowledged, as the prime minister has acknowledged, I mean, there is a world where they actually reduce the targets going forward compared to what their level of ambition was. I wonder what you make of the fact that they are having to take these steps backwards on an issue that has been so central to um, their outlook. It is interesting. I thought the minister made a lot of valid points, but I think they could have, those points were valid a year or two ago, and it just seems very strange that suddenly things, you know, that their, their arguments have, have shifted. Um, this government, as you say, has been really ambitious on the immigration front and, and with temporary foreign workers, and with, especially with allowing the international student growth. Um, I, you know, I think that other co-authors and I have worked on the, the issue of what's the optimal size of an economic immigration program. And, and you have to worry about absor absorptive capacity. Can, do we have the capacity to grow our investments, to grow our public infrastructure, our healthcare system? Can we build houses fast enough? And I think these were all anticipated. I, I'm sure economists in the federal civil service flagged these issues. But the government really embraced it, and and I think we're in a tough spot right now. Yeah, well, in fact, our colleagues at the Canadian Repress, uh, Canadian Press reported several months ago um, documents showing that this had been flagged. I guess in closing, I just want to zero in on something you said at the beginning uh, of of that answer, which was these were arguments that could have been made a year, a year and a half ago. Has the federal government been too slow uh, to start making changes on the immigration front? I think it has. Um, and I think it also points to the question of, you know, it's it's difficult to change policy quickly, right? So, you know, a lot of economists have argued with on the immigration front, let's just focus on skilled immigration, set the targets, like the something called the comprehensive ranking system, stick with it and let the program kind of go on autopilot. It feels like the governments, and it's and it's true of the provincial governments too, to be fair. It's not just the federal government. We're trying to sort of micromanage policy, and it's very hard to get the timing right and the levels right. 
Yeah, well, listen, it's also not a discussion that is uh, going to wrap up anytime soon. It looks like it may only heat up. So we really appreciate you bringing some perspective on this. Thank you, Professor. My pleasure. Christopher Warswick is the chair of the Department of Economics at Carleton University.